Hi, and welcome back to Chemistry Videos with me, Clarissa Sorensen Unruh. Today, we're going to continue our discussion about uh, organic reactions by talking about E1 versus E2. So let's do that. E1 versus E2 reactions. If you did this ideally in the order that you need to, um, you would have done the SNs first, right? You would have watched the video about SN1 versus SN2 first in terms of saying, okay, I just take off a leaving group and I replace it with something else, uh, something that is uh, a nucleophile, right? So the reason why it's called SN is because it's nucleophilic substitution. However, there's a possibility for elimination as well. And the kind of convention that we use for E1 versus E2 is almost the exact same convention we use for SN1 versus SN2, right? The one and the two don't describe how many steps that particular reaction happens in. So that does not describe how many steps that particular reaction happens in. It actually describes the kinetics of that reaction. All right, so let's talk about it for a moment. If we were going to base it off of the SN1, SN2 idea, the ones talk about a reaction that forms an intermediate. All right, so let's do something like that. If we had an E1 reaction, right, it's the same kind of deal we had with um, the SN1 one reaction. Let's do BR here. Okay, and maybe I could add some dimensionality to this or not so much. Not that it matters because if you recognize this particular carbon, this carbon is not a chirality center. And the reason why is because it has two of the same groups on it. Okay. In this case, I'm going to use the exact same kind of nucleophile that I used before, okay, for the SN1 reaction. The nucleophile I used before was a weak nucleophile or weak base. And in this particular case, this is an alcohol, which in most of organic chemistry is actually considered a bit acidic kind of crazy, even though OHs in uh, all of general chemistry, when they're attached to metals, are considered the very def definition of a base. In organic chemistry, they're actually considered weak acids <laughs> when they're attached to carbons. So there you go. Let's take that. This is going to be the nucleophile because it has the lone pairs. It's electron rich. This is going to be the electrophile because it is the carbon directly bonded to the alkyl halide. And I'm going to have an attack between these two. OK, now, what I did originally is I did in SN2, this is what happened. OK, we had a strong nucleophile. You attacked the carbon. The carbon, at the same time that the carbon was attacked by the nucleophile, the leaving group came off. Does this happen for the ones? No, actually, that's not the way this goes, right? We don't even see the nucleophile in this step at all, right? This guy is just hanging out like, woohoo, life is good. The first thing that happens in the ones is that the leaving group leaves. It just goes. It bolts and says, bye. So let's. Do that first. And just like I did before, this is a horrible trigonal planar, but you're going to forgive me for that. All right, so in terms of this, I've now formed a carbocation intermediate. Okay, so the reason why this is a one is not because uh, it happens in one step, it actually happens in two or three steps. The reason why it's a one is because the rate law is based off of the slowest step, which in this case is only the leaving group leaving. The leaving group has to go. And once it goes, then everything else can happen. Okay. Now that I have this lovely plus here, now I can have attack. Let me do this in a color that actually would make sense. 
I could have attack of this carbon. And if I had attack of this carbon, that would be a substitution. But just as easily, there's this carbon right here, which has some awfully tasty H's looking. Have <laughs> I mean, maybe we could call them tasty. Not really. Don't even get close to anything organic in terms of solvents or reactants <laughs> in terms of tasting them. But in terms of this, what's basically going to happen is to this nucleophile, it looks pretty, that H looks pretty tasty. And you're going to have, at the same time that this nucleophile attacks this H, which is my better electrophile in the elimination. So I'm going to eliminate this, right? Because this is no longer the electrophile. If it was the electrophile, that was the electrophile, an even better electrophile than this one over here, then we would have a substitution, not an elimination. Instead, we're going to have, let's see if I can find this, we're going to have this nucleophile attack this H, and that bond is going to go between the carbons instead of, um, instead of having a new, a new bond between the O and the H, when that happens, H can only make one bond at a time. This bond has to be eliminated, and it becomes a bond between the two carbons. And that solves my carbocation problem at the same time. And here I go. Uh, I need to have that as a CH3. Bam. There it is. What happened to this other H? It's still there. That H is exactly where it was, right? If I had attacked this H, it might have been a little easier to see <laughs> instead of this H. But this bond between the C and the H never moved. That's still there, OK? It's only this bond between the C and the H that becomes the double bond between the two Cs, OK? And because you formed a double bond where there wasn't one to begin with, then you have an elimination reaction, OK? And this is, in fact, what happens with all elimination reactions. You don't attack the carbon that has the carbocation, or that is what we consider the, nu or the electrophile and the substitution reactions. You instead attack the carbon right next to it, which sometimes we call the beta carbon. If this is the alpha carbon, the first one, then the beta carbon would be the one right next to it. Um, it's called lots of names. But basically, you're attacking the carbon right next to the electrophile that was true in the SNs. Okay? Ones. Kinetics, first order. It happens in two steps, at least. Okay, this is one, two steps. But in terms of thinking about it, you form the ones always form the reaction intermediate. And that is the carbocation. Because this is true, and notice that we use the exact same one that we had before, right? So we have now this nucleophile, which was exactly the same as before. And we could have another, um, we could have the BR come and take one of these H's off of the nucleophile if we really wanted to, right? So you could have a little woo, reforming of that nucleophile. That actual whole piece that I just drew out doesn't matter. Like, not even a little bit. We don't even care about this part. We don't care whether the BR makes the nucleophile better or not. All that we really care about is we really care about the carbon chain that's now formed. And the fact that it has a double bond between the two Cs, where there wasn't a double bond between the two Cs to begin with, that makes it an elimination. With the carbocation, you could have rearrangements and such. So that's still true. You could rearrange things before you have the elimination. But the important piece is that it's just as easy for this nucleophile to attack the carbon next to the carbocation cation, as it is to attack the carbocation, which means that SN1s and E1s happen together. Finding a way to separate these two is hard. <laughs>
And there are reactions that do it, but you have to find them. Usually they're with alcohols. And so be careful. When you have an SN1 reaction, it's going to be coupled with an E1 reaction almost all of the time. Okay? In terms of E2s, you can, because it's a concerted reaction, it's a little easier to separate, to separate out everything out. Okay? So in terms of looking at this, I don't have a weak nucleophile anymore, which is also a polar protic solvent. I don't have any of that piece anymore. That's usually with the E, with the ones, E1 and SN1, comes the polar protic solvents, because that actually ends up being the nucleophile the vast majority of the time. You basically flood your nucleophile so that there's lots of it there, so that everything can feel really good about reacting, since the leaving group is the first thing that has to go. E2s, just like SN2s, have to happen in a concerted kind of way. Because they happen in a concerted kind of way, that makes them a little more interesting in terms of getting just one reactant. You can make one reactant happen with these. And that's important because one of the things you're learning in organic lab is that it's pretty easy sometimes to make an organic reaction happen. The problem is, is that it almost always makes more than one thing, which is why so much of the lab is spent on separation methods. Because you make a whole, one thing that you want and a whole bunch of stuff you don't. E2s, just like SN2s, happen in, in a concerted kind of way. All right, so let's do something with that. Let's do uh, kind of the same thing we did before. All right, BR, we had a BR here. We had an H and we had a CH3, did we not? Okay, let's say that we use, and this was going back, sorry. <clears throat> let's say that we used a different kind of base here. Still a strong nucleophile, but it's a base more than a nucleophile, right? And the ones we really like to use, we like to use big, huge, bulky bases. There are several bulky bases that you can choose from. DBN, DBU, and then my personal favorite, which is kind of like this. It has a K in front, and then it has a C, and then a CH3, right? Terp-butyl methoxy, kind of, uh, it's actually potassium terp-butyl methoxy. Um, and those are all big, Big bases. <laughs> They're really awesome bases. So in terms of this, look at what's happening here. Am I, let's use my favorite here. It only has a K in front to make sure that you know that it's an anion. Right? Bulky bases. Love it. All right. So in terms of these, and th these are just some. There's lots of bulky bases that you could have. If you look at these, right, bromine is locking up the wedge that's coming forward towards you. The CH3 that's going back is actually pretty big. So none of these look entirely awesome to attack when you have a huge nucleophile. What's much easier to attack is one of the H's on the C next to this guy. So let's do that. Let's take this nucleophile and make one of these H's the electrophile. And when that happens, woo, that happens. H can't have two bonds around it. So one of those bonds is made, so, or is broken. In terms of making the bonds, this O makes a bond to this H. The bond between the C and the H has to break, and that breaking comes with a double bond between the two C's. But notice then, if you make a double bond between the two C's, this C then has five bonds around it. That ain't gonna work. So at the same time, that leaving group leaves. Okay? Whew, that's a lot going on at once. Which makes this C 
to the CH3 and that H, okay? So in terms of looking at these, right, and here's my C to H, this original C to H bond doesn't change at all, okay? What's interesting about this is that that happens pretty quickly, right? That's pretty, a pretty nice reaction. And because it depends on the nucleophile and the leaving group, both, both kind of doing their thing at the same time, the nucleophile has to attack and the leaving group has to leave, then this is second order kinetics. This is a second order reaction, which is where the two comes from, right? It's an elimination because you have a double bond formed where you didn't have one to begin with. It's a two because of the second order reaction. The fact that there's a one right here and a one right there, and if you add one plus one, it equals two. Now, in terms of what made this different than the SN1, how can I, or the SN2? The SN2, I can make happen, right? The E2, I can make happen. The difference between those two is notice that I used the same exact reactant for both. I used a secondary alkyl halide for both. For primary and secondary alkyl halides undergo the twos pretty easily. Secondary and tertiary tertiary alkyl halides undergo the ones pretty easily. So what's the difference between them? Well, so if I want to do ones, I use weak nucleophiles or bases. And then maybe I do a polar uh, product solvent. Often, your nucleophile or base is the exact same thing as the solvent, okay? And it's there to stabilize that carbocation. In terms of, and to get the nucleof, uh, to get the leaving group to leave. In terms of the E2s, what was the difference between the E2 and the SN2? SN2, I used a strong nucleophile. I used a strong nucleophile, which meant, meant it had a minus charge, but it wasn't big. It could slide in, even if there was something there. Here, the big difference between SN2 and E2 is that in E2, I use a big, huge nucleophile, big base. And when I do that, and it's still strong, still a strong big base, but it's huge. And because it's huge, it can't get in on either side. So it attacks the easiest thing that it can see, which is the carbon next to the carbon that has the alkyl halide on it. Okay, and you get the elimination reaction in the majority. Okay, all right. That's a little clarification. Until next time, we'll talk more. Adieu.